Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to the fantastic Melanie Smith. We're talking about using academic skills outside of academia. So particularly looking at the way in which Melanie has conducted consultancy work um, but also we talk about how, as a PhD student, you can use your expertise and the opportunity of doctoral study to work outside of academia. So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, Melanie. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Um, We came across each other online and I was really excited to hear about the work you're doing and your kind of your own journey because you took your academic skills outside academia and we're going to kind of get into that. But I was really interested in talking more to you and I'm so delighted that you've said yes. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I say I'm always really humbled I was just saying to you before we started I'm really humbled by people kind of stepping forward and sharing their knowledge because um, it's so useful I know and I know we're going to get a lot of good stuff today um, good. but we always start I always start with um, asking people about their own story into the PhD um, and then on from there so could you tell us a little bit about your story Okay, so um, my story is not a conventional academic story. Love it. <laughs> um, so I was first in my family to go to university. Um, my father was um, a minor, my mother a housewife. I lived in, um, you know, a very small town, lots of unemployment. Nobody really went to university. Um, but I went to King's College London, which was a proper culture shock nice. when I was doing my undergraduate <laughs> degree. And then, um, and then, like all, I think, working class um, students, I really needed to earn money. And so yes. I left academ- the academic environment and I, I started to to work and there was it was just the tail end of recession then and there was no jobs and the only jobs there were was sort of banking um so I love the way you said that I know well, I'm, I'm, you you. I'm, no, I'm preparing you for what's coming so um I did a lot of little careers you know I, did, I dabbled in lots of different things but I ended up um working for an asset management company um, and then I went to work in Deutsche Bank which is one of the big investment banks and then I went to work in Goldman Sachs who I'm sure you've all yes. heard of yes. um, and so that was um, so unbelievably boring right. I cannot <laughs> tell you um, and I really felt quite brain dead um, right. having worked in these environments which was just the same thing over and over again and so I decided, you know, in one of these, it used to be called a quarter life crisis when I was young back in the day, mm. um, in the 90s. And um, I the 1990s, that is not the 1890s, <laughs> you know, I feel very old, but I'm not that old. Um, so I decided to go back to college and I went back to King's and I did a master's. Um, but it, in that in those days, it was really, it was really great. It was a University of London um, master. So there was UCL, King's, LSE, um, and another one, Queen Mary, I think, all doing this master's across the different universities. So I, I had the most fantastic time. And I realized, oh, gosh, I, I really want to stay here. <laughs> I want to stay mm-hmm. in school because, you know, the, you know, banking is awful. So and what was your topic um, at master's? What were you... I did. I so I split my masters between two subjects. Um, ever indecisive. I did um, constitutional law. So I did. So I'm a lawyer by training. So I did sort of human rights and administrative law, which is a kind of constitutional law bracket. And then I also did European law. So I did right. um, internal market in the European Union, and I did constitutional and administrative law of the e- of the EU. So that was my kind of master's spread, as it were. Wow. Um, and then I found out to stay in college and to, you know, be a lecturer, you needed a PhD. And I, I found this all quite 
hilarious you know I thought I'm just not the kind of person who can do a PhD you know all of that stuff um but anyway I thought well what I can't go back to banking I just can't face it so how hard <laughs> can this be you know um and so I just threw myself in and, and applied and got a scholarship and ended up at Manchester University for super practical reasons they were offering pay <laughs> um, nice. yes. yes and I needed the money and uh so yeah, I I ended up doing starting my PhD at Manchester, but actually finishing it at Edinburgh University because my supervisor left, nice. and um, nice. I was both working as a, a graduate a teacher, but I was also working on her grant. She had a big grant in, and I was a, a research assistant nice. on a grant. So I was kind of juggling many things um, whilst doing my PhD. So that is how I got into graduate study. Um, okay. As an aversion to investment banking. <laughs> <laughs> I say, we, were, there, we need some kind of disclaimer, I think, for this episode in terms yeah. of no, no bankers were harmed in yeah. the recording of this interview. Um, yeah. Right, brilliant, brilliant. So you get yourself there, you've got into academia, you've got your PhD, um, but then I'd love you to talk a bit about kind of what happens next and what you, what you do with those, with those skills now. Right. Okay. So, well, there is a little bit of a, there's a bridge between those yes. two, 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 you know, events. So I, I was lucky enough to get my first job. I hadn't quite finished my PhD. So I was, had the conclusions to write and I'm, I managed to get a lectureship. And um, in the course of doing my PhD research, I had done some um, elite interviews. So I had gone out to the European institutions, the European Parliament, the European Commission, the Ombudsman, and I had interviewed them as part of my research. So I had done a lot of these interviews and I had gotten to know people quite, you know, quite low down because they're the people who are going to tell you the truth, as well as the people quite high up who will be more political. Um, mm. And um, so that was part of my PhD. And then when I started work at at Cardiff, where I, I was a lecturer, um, I obviously, you know, finished my PhD, and then I, I made a book from it. And to, to, because time had moved on, although only 18 months, lots of things had happened in the real world. So I had to go back to the European institutions and re-interview lots of different people. And really off the back of these conversations is where I, I started the consultancy work. So I actually started being a, a full-time, uh, a, a expert advisor, shall we call it, a consultant, whilst being a full-time lecturer. Wow. So I was doing both at the same time. And I didn't see them as different jobs because they were, you know, impact and engagement was not a thing 20 years ago when I was started. It really, no, I mean, it was actually, I, I remember being quite frowned upon in my department because I was out in the dirty real world of politics, you know, and I wasn't scholarly pure, you know, in yes, that yes, way. Yes, yes. Um, how, how the worm is Exactly, turned, how interesting know? now. Um, so, so yeah, so I started to, to, I was contacted, you know, by the people I had been interviewing saying, hey, listen, we, we, we love this research. We've read your research in the journals, come back to parliament. And, and it started quite small and then it kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger uh, as a rolling stone as it were so I would say I had been doing that as for 10 full years as an academic before I left academia and and started what I'm doing now which is a combination of things mm. and so I love that because um we talk it comes up in lots of people's stories in terms of like a kind of side hustle if you like that yeah. I'm not sure about that term but the kind of things that you're doing on the side the peripheral things in your studies and the contacts that you've made then become something really substantial and something really important in your career um, and of course the, that permission giving moment of being a PhD student in terms of saying I'm, I, can I talk to you for my PhD and just obviously you really went into that and engaged with people and just I, I think there's there's something really inspirational about that and if people are listening to to kind of think oh yeah no I could do that I could start meeting with people in a, in a genuine way that yes. works for your research but also who knows where it might lead you 
Absolutely. And I had no thoughts about it leading anywhere, honestly. Um, yes. And, you know, I started with, I needed these people. I, I was researching something that was very diplomatically sensitive. So it, it was secret. And so yes. there, there was no public information about it. That's why I was writing a PhD about it. Um, and the whole part, the whole problem with it was that it was secret. So getting information out of these people was uh -huh. actually quite tricky. Uh -huh. But what I but so I had to literally go and talk to them. And it was only to get that information that I that I made. So there was no agenda behind that. That was literally part of the research. Yes. And and I have to say, you know, um, so people, I've done lots of talks on this and, and how did I get into it? And I think, you know, my main focus at that time was getting my my research into the policy. Mm. I was obsessed with that. Whether the department cared about that or not, I didn't really care. I mean, the whole reason I'd written this research was so that somebody would do what I said, you know, somebody would actually it. listen to kind that. of what I wanted to happen, you know, yes. and take yes. up this 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 cause. And yes. um, so when I was contacted, and it starts off quite small, you know, um, somebody one of the one of the you know all of these politicians have the people who do the real work behind them and one of them needs to write a resolution for the whole of the European Parliament and they want to use my research but really they want my help writing this resolution because I can do it much more incisively than they can because I'm all over this this is all I think about 24 hours a day and you know this is one of a million things they think about in their job so I start giving that time for free and yes. people are like, oh, free labor. But I was being paid as an academic, remember, OK, yes. so I was on a full time yes. contract, yes. permanent. I saw this as part of my role, spreading yes. the message. Um, and so that's how it started. I was I was helping out writing these resolutions. Then when Ref came around and it was like, oh, we need to trace your impact, I started to say to them, oh, listen, you have to cite me now. It's not enough that I just help you. I mean, I wrote a very blunt email saying, look, you know, I need, I need the traceability because of this research excellence framework thing. So, and they did, they cited me in, in the resolution, you know, and they were quite happy to do that. And quite right too, is your work. <laughs> exactly. But, but you know, I, that's not how it initially no. uh, approached it. So, yes. Yes. and there was a lot of that over a few years. And then suddenly, you know, you get invited to come in behind closed doors to secret meetings where, almost I'm acting as an advocate on, on behalf of, of the parliament to grill the European Commission because the commission hold all the information and therefore, you know, the parliament isn't equipped to ask the right questions because they don't know what questions to ask. But I do because, again, it's all I'm ever thinking about. So, and then you go from that to conferences to, and then you're, you know, giving speeches on the floor of the European parliament and then, and then, you know, then you're on the kind of Rolodex, you know, of... Um, <gasps> Yes. Anytime they they want someone on this particular topic, it's my name is my name comes up, you know. Yes. So absolutely. If you're a PhD student and you need to any part of your research, you either want it to touch the real world or you have to, in fact, you know, talk to people, even if you don't need it for your research, I would highly recommend getting out there and and making contact with people who are going to use your research, it will pay dividends in the long run. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be really motivational for people too, in terms of this work, you know, when you're having that awful day of like, what am I even doing this for? It's kind of yeah. like, that's what I'm doing it for, for those people. Like it's going to make a difference. Like you say, that yeah. for you, you wanted to impact policy. And I think that can be a really powerful motivating force as well on the kind of wet Wednesday you yeah, and you know, up. I never really had that feeling about. Oh, really not? Isn't that isn't that interesting? I mean, I felt like, what am I really doing here? In many ways, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, academic meetings in particular. But I really never had that lack of motivation with yeah. research. Um, yeah. I was, you know, I could. My work did make a difference. It yes. was taken up by the policymakers. Yes. I did see the results of that. I did see the change. Um, and I was constantly, you know, sh shoving my R in all the time, like poking the hornet's nest with them. So I was always creating new conversations within the policymakers as, as well. So I really got a lot out of it, like, like really personally as a motivational yes. factor. Um, yes. The fact that it then led to paid work, that came later, but it, was, yes. it wasn't the initial 
yeah, it wasn't the initial drive. I'd still say it's really not the drive, um, but maybe that's a position of privilege. But uh, yes, and, and I, I think it, I loved what you said about kind of not not having an agenda. So it's not that kind of um, networky thing. Actually, no. it was passion driven by passion, and you can hear it in your voice. And I think that's kind of that. It, I mean, it, it's kind of a well I mean I love I love the woo-woo stuff in terms of kind of follow your bliss but genuinely <laughs> following your passion actually leads you to really exciting places and a, kind of your story is so inspirational in that I, I love it love yeah it. and I think I want to say I mean although you can't see me um I'm not people imagine that the expert advisors to the European Parliament are these old male gray-haired professors from Oxford, you know, and I, I don't look like that. And especially, you know, when I started my PhD, I was 30, actually. Well, I was finished when I was 30, but I looked about 12 and I don't really <laughs> look my age now. And I'm sh- I'm only five foot tall and I, I don't fit this mold of what you might imagine these the, the expert advisor to look like. And I think that's also something I wanted to say, like, you know, if, if you're sat there thinking, oh, I could I could never do that or I, I would never be taken seriously. I think, you know, your expertise will speak for you. Yes. yes. Um, and, you, you know, you should know the value of that expertise. Yes. 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 In the yes. real world, not just in academia. I love it. I love it. And I have to also say that you're not only advisor to all these important people there's a set of other very important people that you advise um in terms of working with PhD students yeah. and um so that work has become important to you too in terms of sharing your knowledge and um your experience there yes I mean so I I was full-time academic for uh, 20 years at Cardiff I'm now uh, technically emerita there because I was there that long I actually got to have that title when I left Um, But I left to start up a business, Academic Coach, and that business delivers um, a variety of services. So I I do one-to-one PhD uh, coaching. I do one-to-one academic coaching. I have PhD in academic writing courses, which are online uh, courses that you can take and lots of different online uh, modules you can do. And I also work for universities um, either directly by coaching postgraduate students that, you know, the service is bought in, I suppose what I'm saying, by the university, or indeed by academic departments who buy me in to coach staff on writing, research development, career development, you name it. It's it's quite varied work. So that is the career that I have um, started up in the last um, two and a half years. I mean, I really started it whilst I was at Cardiff. Um, because I started it in the department. Nice. So nice. I started to coach faculty and PhD students within my department. For, they were my crash test dummies. In a way. <laughs> they were my beta testers. And uh, I thought, no, this is a thing that I'm really, I really enjoy this more than I enjoy all of the other things that I'm doing. And um, I was always in charge of mentoring and, and and doing those kinds of things so I was always really interested in that side of the role but what I found frankly was that 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 side of academic life now is is squeezed right yeah I hear you and and so PhD students don't get mentored in the way that they might be mentored and 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 um, academic colleagues, junior colleagues are not getting mentored in the way that maybe I I experienced when I was a, a, a junior scholar. So I think there's quite a big gap there. No, absolutely, which is part of why I started up the podcast in terms of offering some yeah. kind of support. Yeah. Um, yes, so all your details will be in the show notes so that people can find it because I am sure they will want to find out more about you. Um, so people will be able to... Um, follow follow up from that there um before I let you go I always ask a very unfair question in terms of can you give us um a top tip Ooh, a top tip in relation to well I'll give you a few top tips a top tip in relation to becoming um to becoming an expert advisor or to take your expertise outside of 
the academic environment. I think my top tip would be to believe in your own expertise, but also be very flexible in how you define that expertise. Um, I think as PhD students and as academics, we can get quite narrow and niche in what we consider ourselves to be experts in. Um, but actually we have a whole panoply of skills that you can take um, besides your very narrow disciplinary uh, set of set of skills that you can take into the real world. And they are so valued outside of academia. Um, the work is really in translating them uh, for which I could talk about for hours. So that's the one, that's one thing. Um, and in terms of um, getting through your PhD and, and thriving and not surviving, I have lots of resources on my blog, free resources that you can look at. But, you know, cultivate a supportive network and don't put all of your eggs in the supervisory basket, I think, yes. would it be another top tip, um, because that puts too much pressure on everybody. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Here, here. Yeah. so much wisdom there thank you so much um what a fascinating story thank you um and as i say all the information will be on the show notes and if you want a bit extra every week we do notes from the life raft and um, and with some more information so you can sign up for that um is at the bottom of the show notes also on the website um thank you so much melanie for being here you're welcome and thank you all for listening.